Greetings. I wanted to share something that is part of the class that I sometimes teach at Stanford, as you can see in this lower right hand corner, as well as a component of the many keynotes that I give on the topic of AI. I have in fact spoken to audiences as large as 3,000 people. And this is about how to see where we are within the long term progression of AI and how the news cycle of AI tends to keep people distracted from the broader megatrends underneath. So the first concept to be introduced is how AI keeps getting redefined. Whenever a form of AI succeeds, it is no longer called AI. Now what does that mean? Well, here's a historical progression of events. In the 1980s, it was often said that when AI defeats a human at chess, humans are obsolete. Now that's quite a leap of logic to make, but that was considered the big threshold of AI sophistication when an AI defeats a human at chess. Now chess players are not software engineers and therefore don't realize how hyper customized a certain software program can become versus is it anything more than an ultra narrow specialized program. Because in 1997, you may be aware of this, the best chess player in the world at the time was Garry Kasparov and an artificial intelligence program defeated him. And don't just look at his face, look at the face of the people in the audience. They were told that this was some major historical event and we are thus on the verge of something like we saw in 2001, A Space Odyssey. What was less well known at the time was that this program was customized not just to play chess, but to specifically play chess against one individual, Garry Kasparov. And the chess community didn't understand how hyper-specialized this program could become. Had they known this, they could have said, okay, this AI has to play against all of the top 100 chess players and let's see how many of them it can beat because it is only programmed to defeat Garry Kasparov. It was extremely specialized for one very, very, very narrow task. So this came in the news for a while, but then people forgot about it. That was 1997, a long time ago. But over time, Time, AI got broader. So it was said, okay, chess is one thing. And we later learned that you created a chess program only to play against one specific person. Let's take a broader measurement, a game like Jeopardy. Because in the 2000s, they used to say, when an AI defeats a human at Jeopardy, then humans are obsolete. And probably everyone watching this remembers this event in 2011. The two best human Jeopardy players at the time, equivalent to the Garry Kasparovs of Jeopardy, played against IBM Watson. And here, you could actually quantify the margin of defeat and they both lost heavily because IBM Watson reached $1 million when the two Human Jeopardy players were only at 300,000 and 200,000. And even this hardware that was made to be the same size as these humans was just put there for television. They don't have to put anything there. So this is broader. This was not structured just to defeat two particular Jeopardy players. This could field all the questions and even understand what was being asked and respond in the grammatical sentence structure that Jeopardy answers require. So this was substantially broader of an application than the 1997 chess program that was designed to defeat only Garry Kasparov and no other chess player. So the bar got pushed a little higher. Jeopardy is not enough of a measurement, they said. What is the most difficult game in the world? There's a game called Go that I don't think most of us play because it's only played in China, Japan, and South Korea. And it was said that when an AI defeats a human at Go, humans are obsolete. In 2016, a program called AlphaGo defeated the top Go players in the world. Now this was even less of a news event because nobody even knows what Go is. But now there were no remaining games left that an AI could not do better in than a human. So then the threshold got pushed higher. It was said that games are not the appropriate measurement because those are not economically relevant tasks, let's say. So we have to find some measurement other than games. And that continues to happen to this day. All of these things listed here used to be considered AI in 1982. 1982 was the last time there was a peak in AI activity and AI was not a business that had a lot of dollars associated with it. This was again 1982, but nonetheless, calculator, search engine, speech recognition, virtual assistants, computer vision, and autonomous driving were all considered AI before they happened. Even calculators because people did not have calculators of their own until 1974 or so. All of these used to be called AI. If people from 1982 were to see the world of 2023, they would think that AI is everywhere. Each person carries a supercomputer in their pocket that is inexpensive and contains seven or eight different types of AI. That is what 1982 people in the field of AI would see today as, even though none of these things are considered AI. 
everyone is fixated on chat GPT because for them it was a surprise that this emerged. But it's not a surprise if you have been following the historical progression of AI for many decades and are in the field itself. I am in the field of AI and have been for many years. So in closing, there is a thought that I want you to internalize, which is that AI is becoming the air we breathe. We would only notice it if it were gone. There'll be more AI-oriented content to follow as events unfold and more topics worthy of videos emerge. And if you like this type of content, I encourage you to subscribe to this channel. Thank you very much for watching.